<laughs> Thanks, Brendan. I actually wasn't expecting anyone to turn up, so I was a bit shocked that so many people are here. Um, but today I thought I'd take a different approach. I've listened to most of the other professorial lectures um, to some of my colleagues um, in uh, my lecture today. Uh, it's been uh, a big year for me in, in that I've graduated from my PhD um, at ANU and was promoted to professor. And so in preparing for this lecture, um, originally I was going to do an academic piece on Indigenous rights and international law. But um, uh, since I joined the Permanent Forum, I'm a little bit sick of talking about that. So I thought it would be the opportunity to reflect on um, where I've come in terms of my own personal uh, journey from, um, well, as the title says, from Queensland to the UN but certainly in terms of um, doing my LLB as a student to, to, to now as a um, professor in the law school. Um, so it's um, uh, uh, somewhat of a personal journey I'll take you through um, today. Um, and when, I, when reflecting on this journey, uh, it was interesting for me to consider um, how much I've witnessed in the past decade uh, with the development of the Indigenous Rights Framework uh, in international law um, from when I was a student. Um, participating in that to, to, to now. And I thought that um, this personal journey would be of some interest, particularly to students, um, and I know we've had these conversations at the Indigenous Law Centre um, with um, many students grappling with um, really difficult decisions, important life decisions about what to do when you graduate. Um, and as always, at, at UNSW Law School, it is a uh, law school that is infused with a really strong sense of social justice and community responsibility. And um, a lot of students feel conflicted about whether to pursue um, you know, a corporate path or a path in human rights or in the community sector or at the UN. And so I hope that some of what I have to say um, may help um, in, in those uh, decisions because I too was faced with a similar dilemma um, for a fleeting moment anyway, about a decade ago when I finished my um, LLB at the University of Queensland. And uh, as many of you would know, this is my first year serving on the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, uh, where I serve as an expert on Indigenous uh, international human rights law. Um, yet interestingly, I, I realised that it was actually in my final year of my LLB when I won a fellowship to the, to the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. And so that set me on my path um, to where I am today. So I thought it'd be interesting to map the development of Indigenous rights um, in international law alongside my own personal journey, even though it's kind of a little bit more personal than it is um, Indigenous rights. So I wanted to talk about um, a couple of things. I'll just talk quickly about um, my, so, so some of my background, my own personal background, because I think we, we talk quite often, particularly at the ILC, but especially um, more broadly at the law school about um, uh, a commitment to social justice. And so I wanted to talk about some of the key influences on me um, growing up that, that set me on my path. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about my first entree into international law um, in Geneva while I was a law student. Um, and then talk about my most recent work and then some concluding thoughts on the international human rights law system. And I hope that um, some of you find it interesting or, or useful in the decisions that you have to make. Um, so I was, I was thinking about um, my early years, where does that commitment to social justice come from? Because I, I know the ILC, we like to say it comes from the ILC or it comes from UNSW Faculty of Law, but a lot of people come um, um, to, to the law school and, and to the ILC with very strong, already very strong sense of responsibility to community, responsibility to the Aboriginal community and, and a really strong sense of social justice. And I've been associated with UNSW Law School for about nine years actually. I started in 2002 when I was the director um, of the Bill of Rights project, which seems a little quaint now given that um, there's no chance of that ever happening. But I was the director of a Bill of Rights project for uh, w working with George Williams, Professor George Williams at um, the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law. So I've always felt um, really comfortable um, working in this law school and really attracted to the ethos of social justice that's espoused by um, the law school. And I was thinking, so, so where does that come from? Um, um, and where does my own passion for social justice and human rights come from? And uh, uh, just a little bit about my background. My um, family is Aboriginal and Australian, Aboriginal South Sea Island and Australian. So everyone's always like, where did your mum come from? But she's, she's Australian and she says she has absolutely no interest um, in claiming at all her Scottish heritage. So 
Um, one doesn't have those conversations with mum. She is Australian and that, that's the end of the story. Um, my dad is Aboriginal and South Sea Islander. So um, the South Sea Island um, family comes from um, Marlow Island and Vanuatu. And most students of Australian history would be aware of uh, blackbirding, which refers to the practice of recruiting labourers through kidnapping and uh, trickery to work on the sugar plantations in, in Queensland. Um, and there were something like 62,000 people who were blackbirded between 1863 and 1904. So that's where um, uh, my island side comes from. Um, and they worked on the sugar canes in Mackay. My Aboriginal side is uh, Cobble Cobble from Warra in southwest Queensland, which is halfway between Dolby and Chinchilla. Um, my great grandmother was Lily Davis. Uh, my grandfather Fred's mother and Lily um, had about six or seven uh, children, including my grandfather Fred, who were all moved off country from Warra um, to the mission in Sherberg, as, as many Aboriginal people were at the time. Um, and this is why we grew up with um, as much Walker identity as, as we did Cobble. Cobble. Uh, my grandfather, um, so they all grew up on the mission at Sherberg. Um, my grandfather eventually left and worked throughout Queensland country as a stockman and cane cutter and timber cutter. Um, and eventually he busted his brother out of the, the mission and they eventually settled in Harvey Bay um, where they bought a piece of land and, and that, that is where I grew up. I mean the land has a really interesting history. They used to hide other Harvey Bay blackfellas uh, from the police who used to travel around Harvey Bay trying to round up um, um, Aboriginal people and, and, and take them to the missions. Um, my grandfather Fred and his brother also used to send boxes of fresh fruit back up on the train to the Sherberg mission. Um, my cousins remember the days of boxes of fruit and blankets arriving from the Davises at Harvey Bay. Um, um, and for those who know anything about the mission system in Australia, um, and particularly Sherberg mission, um, they were um, um, pretty appalling standards of, of living. And when I went up to Sherberg for the expert panel consultations on the recognition of Aboriginal people in the constitution, um, a lot of the elders at Sherberg remembered my um, grandfather and my family. Um, and um, they remember um, him bringing them, bringing fresh um, uh, fish, seafood up from Harvey Bay um, to feed the mob in Sherberg. So late last year, we, were, um, uh, we officially registered our um, Ilua, our Indigenous Land Use Agreement. Um, on behalf of the Darling Downs traditional owners um, with uh, Queensland Gas Company, who's developing a Queensland um, LNG pipeline um, over our country. Um, so that was after a, a long drawn out process, uh, but it would be nice to have that continued access um, to our land and especially the Bunya Mountains and hopefully some employment for young Aboriginal kids living in the area. But as many of you know, Aboriginal people lived on missions um, and their lives were controlled by the Protection Acts. And there was a raft of Protection Acts right across the country that controlled the lives of um, Aboriginal people. And about a decade ago, we did some research and accessed all my grandfather's files uh, um, uh, where we got all of um, the letters that he'd ever written to the uh, Aboriginal protector, um, where uh, he had written asking for um, access to inheritance, um, permission to marry, um, uh, permission to attend a funeral um, and there are a couple of letters around permission to buy a blanket, permission to, to, to buy a lamp. Um, so every facet of Aboriginal people's lives were controlled um, by these protection acts. Um, but what I thought was interesting in, in looking at his letters was that you can see a really strong empathy for the plight of his people in the letters that he wrote um, to the protector. But he was also very measured in his tone and um, quietly emphasised the fact that he was a committed union man and always paid his union fees and, um, and then eventually a rate payer and, and these kinds of things when he was asking for um, um, the, the permission to use his own money. So while he was not, and, and my family has never been um, a, a political a, at all, um, family history such as mine mean that you do develop a strong sense of um, injustice and powerlessness at a young age. And I, and I know in our community that can either bring, bring you down or if used in the right way, um, you can marshal it towards something else. Um, so that's just a bit about my um, family background, which I think is very much influenced the work um, um, 
that, that I've done in the way I think about um, human rights. I actually did my schooling um, not at Harvey Bay but in Eagleby, which is halfway um, between the Gold Coast and Brisbane, um, which is not far from Kingston actually. It's only a couple of suburbs across from where there was a horrific fire two nights ago. Uh, we were like many Aboriginal families in the area, really poor. Um, my mum had left my dad in Harvey Bay and there was about six of us living in a very small three bedroom housing commission house. And there was no way at the time we could afford um, fees for a private education. Um, and so we were really fortunate that the local Catholic schools let us attend the Catholic school for free. Um, mum made a token concessional payment every fortnight. Um, but the, um, uh, the Catholic system supported my school education right through to uh, the University of Queensland where I was fortunate to board on campus at um, the Girls Catholic College. But in, in co contemplating where my journey started and thinking about my early life before, um, life before law, before enrolling in law, and my path to the UN, I, I, I kind of, um, I'm really, uh, I think there were five really key influences that I believe have infused the way that I think about human rights and social justice. And I think it's really important for everyone um, to reflect on this and, and, and where they come from. I think it's a really useful exercise and it certainly is when one is thinking about the decision that they're going to make next um, um, when leaving law school. So I think, first of all, the notion of social justice as, as taught to me was really, um, I was very heavily, heavily influenced by my, um, my, by my Catholic education, especially um, in secondary school, where the school had a really strong commitment to, um, to volunteering in the community and giving back to the community. So there was a really strong sense um, that of giving and giving your time to people. Um, the other really great, I, I think, influence was, of course, um, my mother, who instilled it in us at a very young age, the importance of um, a lifelong commitment to helping others who, for various reasons, uh, need assistance in helping themselves. Um, and she felt very strongly about working to help the marginalised. Although she wasn't at all a religious person, she always says she, she just joined the Catholic Church to get us into the schools. Um, but she um, was very uh, strong about, um, 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 in, in, you know, um, compelling us to work in careers that would help others. The other thing that I think is really interesting that I've never really thought about, but I think a lot of the work I do um, in human rights is is very much about, I guess. Uh, my underclass statement, I, I identify, uh, sorry, my underclass status. I identify not just as an Aboriginal woman, um, but also as the child of a low socioeconomic upbringing. Um, and indeed, a lot of Aboriginal issues are inaccurately classified as, as, as race, um, when in fact they are economic issues. Um, and although clearly um, I'm not underclass anymore, I do strongly identify with what social commentators call the forgotten people in Australia. And of course, being poor doesn't, um, um, doesn't leave you. It doesn't change just because you earn a better income. Um, being poor stays with you for life. And I think um, Noel Pearson and Marty Langton talk about that really eloquently when they talk about um, the importance of um, financial literacy, for example, um, uh, um, um, not having uh, good money skills or money literacy. I mean, these things you carry with your whole life. The other thing uh, I was thinking about um, when thinking about key influences is the importance of education for, for, for women and girls. And my mum was very strong about this, about the importance of me and my sister getting a really strong education. Uh, education is empowering, as we all know, and my experience um, in Aboriginal affairs and in international law at the UN is that it's still very much a, a man's world and the patriarchy is still very strong. But if you do have a solid education, it gives you the confidence to, um, to offer strong opinions, to have strong, strong opinions, but it also gives you the imagination uh, to dream up new ideas and see the world in, in a different way. And it gives women a voice. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, um, you can really make a difference. Um, and that's what I really like about the Indigenous Law Centre, for example. It's full of very clever um, and opinionated sometimes over-opinionated young women <laughs> who intern with us, um, who research with us, who have edited our journals, 
and they're so supremely confident of their views and their place in the world and their intelligence and that's a really good thing and a good thing to foster in the, in the centre because it is tested once you leave the safety of, um, of, a, law, of a law school because you soon realise that not everybody is interested in giving um, you space for your thoughts um, and your ideas when you, when you are a woman. And, and finally, before I move on to um, how I started in international law, the, the, the really the key influence that I think in, in terms of, um, um, of, of my own journey is the role of books. Um, I am a prolific reader and I always have been since I was a child and our house had wall-to-wall -wall books. Um, and in fact, last year there was this really interesting study in the Australian Higher Education Review which reported um, a, a study in, in a journal um, called Research and Social Stratification and Mobility that found the size of a home library had a more significant impact on educational attainment and social mobility than anything else, even adjusting for parents' education and father's occupation. And my mum, I mean, we used to be so embarrassed by her. She used to fossick around in crusty old second-hand bookstores. We really hated it. She'd come home with these bags just full of books. Um, and because, you know, we didn't have very much money, but she always had money to buy plastic bags and bags and bags full of books. Um, and and at the time, we'd all roll our eyes, but, but now I kind of understand what it is that she was doing um, and that she was exposing us to a culture of books and a culture of reading. And particularly for kids in low socioeconomic homes, it's really um, important. And when we were very young, in the mid-80s, she bought a subscription to Time magazine. Um, and I think that really changed my life as a young kid in terms of my interest and knowledge in the United Nations. And it was Time America. Um, and I remember it used to be delivered every Wednesday and I would rip open the cover and just devour it from cover to cover. And this is where I first read about the Middle East and I first read about the role of the UN, um, in particular the Security Council, and, um, and where I ripped out a little picture of the General Assembly and put that on my wall in my senior years. That kind of sounds really uncool, but um, I, as Jeanette would know this year, <laughs> When I did my first stint as, a, as the expert on this UN panel, it was quite something to be able to sit in that General Assembly room after um, having had that on my wall as a kid. Um, and interestingly enough, um, the book that really shaped my interest in public law and my love of public law and constitutional law was um, Sir John Kerr's Matters for Judgment, which really infuriates a lot of people. Um, but I was homesick one day and um, mum bought it home from a second-hand bookshop, of course. And... Um, Look, it just really struck me, um, and, 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 and this was before I was indoctrinated about the truth on the double disillusion, um, <laughs> but it really struck me, the Australian legal and political system, this fight that had gone on over the double disillusion, and at the back there was an extract from the Australian Constitution, and I, just, I still remember that as being a, um, a really significant day in my life, and I still have that book. But what books and reading um, does is allow you to escape and exercise your imagination and, and be able to dream. And literature especially gives you an uh, insight into the way human beings, um, in fact, have universal experiences and shared emotions all over the world in a way that unites us. Um, and I think that was something interesting to take with me to the, to, to the UN, where often, particularly in the adversarial contests between Indigenous peoples in the state, one would think we came from different planets. Um, so just in finishing th that particular section, uh, my message um, um, particularly to students who are about to make that decision or think about making that decision, that it, it's important to stay true to who you are um, and not to do um, things if you don't want to do it. Don't let others dictate or others' dreams dictate what your journey is. Um, because when I um, decided to take the UN uh, fellowship over other things, um, you know, you're swimming against the tide. Everybody says to you, oh my God, you're not going to do a clerkship. Oh my God, you're not going to do your articles. Well, that was in the days where articles were. Um, and, and it will be the end of the world for you. Um, you can't possibly not take that route. And so it's really important to keep that, that in mind, that it's important to, to, to stay true to yourself. But now, on to how I got into international law. It really just happened at exactly the same time my entree into the United Nations and Indigenous law. As I said, my family weren't really a family of Indigenous activists. They didn't do protests and community activist meetings or anything. We were quite quiet, um, read a lot, played sport. Um, 
But I do think not being embedded in a political activist way or the movement has helped me, I believe, in my thinking and shaped my thinking about Aboriginal affairs and the role of the state in a way that other people who are embedded in the movement um, um, have been. So during my law school and my penultimate year, I was told by Jackie Huggins, a prominent Aboriginal historian at the University of Queensland, that there was a job going at a place called the Foundation for Aboriginal Islander Research Action, which is known as FARA. And the head of this organisation was a bloke called Les Malba, an Aboriginal activist who is now the head of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. And um, so Les apparently wanted a law student to come in and do research. So I turned up to Farah one day and met Les and was promptly hired to do research on intellectual property laws in Australia and developments in international law around the World Intellectual Property Organisation and, and this idea of traditional knowledge and how do you better protect traditional knowledge. And so I rocked up one day to Farah after about a week and he said to me, do you, do you want to go to Geneva um, to a WIPO meeting and to a United Nations working group on Indigenous populations? And, um, and, you know, I didn't have a passport. No one in my family had a suitcase. Um, but I was like, yeah, sure. Um, so literally by the end of the week, I'd, they'd got me my passport. Um, I didn't have, we still didn't get a suitcase because no one had any money. So my brother, who still asked for the money back, lent me $40 to buy a blue backpack from the local camping store, um, which I took my clothes in. Um, and basically I was on a, on a, on a plane um, um, to, to, to Geneva the next week. And, and this experience was really life-changing as, as a law student um, of both the experience of being in Geneva and being immersed in another culture and also um, of the UN. And did I, I remember, I mean, I was so naive at the time, I remember I was on the Qantas plane and the ladies doing the safety demonstration. And I, I, re I do remember thinking to myself when she was doing the safety demonstration and talking about taking off your high heels on the slide um, raft, I remember thinking, oh my God, I must remember to take my shoes off. Um, not knowing that actually no one survives a plane crash, but um, <laughs> but but nevertheless, it was a, it was an interesting experience. So there I was, uh, you know, a couple well not a couple of hours, about thirty hours later in Geneva. I mean, it was just the most extraordinary, life changing experience. Um, and to have it at that time when I was um, um, still at law school. So what was most striking to me, um, and which is revelationary to most people who attend Indigenous UN meetings for the first time is the universal nature of the impact of colonisation upon Indigenous cultures and the similarity of laws and policies that are, are adopted by states globally to oppress peoples, including the prohi prohibition on people speaking their own languages, which, which is really common, and uh, the removal of people from their lands, um, as well as assimilatory policies such as removal of, of children. And I think Jeanette um, Murdoch, our coordinator of the Indigenous Law Centre had that similar emotional response when she attended the, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous issues with me in New York. It's quite an overwhelming experience to be confronted by all of these many stories of human rights violations around the globe. Then on the other hand, I was really struck by the way that, so, that many states of the world had actually tried to enact creative and remedial, if imperfect, laws and policies to better accommodate Indigenous peoples into their public institutions. So um, some states and their diplomatic representatives felt very strongly about improving the lives of the Indigenous peoples within their state borders and had an enormous amount of goodwill towards those peoples. So I was, I was really struck um, by, by, by those two things. One, how much is being done in, in other parts of the world when it comes to Indigenous issues and, and, and secondly, that there was, a, in, in, with some countries, a lot of really good will towards um, Indigenous peoples and, and improving in the situation and human rights of Indigenous peoples. So that was really, I think, in terms of my research, the first time that I realised that, in fact, Australia had done comparatively very little. So at the time, we did have the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, um, but ATSIC was a statutory creature, and as we found out, it was vulnerable to alteration and repeal. Um, also at this time I discovered that there was the drafting of this instrument, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it was in its relative infancy in terms of the drafting. But the Declaration had been developed as a consequence of these many horrific stories that were told at the UN Working Group on Indigenous Peoples. Um, so each and every article of the Declaration reflects these truly awful and harrowing stories from people about the way that they'd been treated within their own countries by states. 
Um, so to that extent, it was a really life-changing experience um, in my penultimate year of, of law school. So I was really conscious um, when I came back from the trip that this not be regarded as a junket. Um, and at the Farrah Christmas party, that was my Christmas gift I was presented with, was a packet of junket. Um, now that doesn't always get a lot of laughs because a lot of kids don't know what junket is these days. <laughs> Apparently it's not on the market, or it's on the market in health shops, but it's like a little custard thing, but I used to like it. Um, so anyway, I've got a packet of junket. Haha, <laughs> you know, I'd gone to this trip to Geneva and um, nothing would come of it. But I really wanted it to be productive and valuable. Um, I didn't want to be pigeonholed really as just you know, an activist who flies to Geneva and doesn't get a lot or, or, or achieve a lot. So on my return, I, I applied for a fellowship at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Geneva. And um, I, I guess <laughs> I was being presumptuous, but I enrolled in French immediately in my final year of law. Um, and fortunately, I won the fellowship, so um, I was able to use my French. But um, um, I was able to move to Geneva in my final year of my LLB um, to do the fellowship, um, where I sat actually, I sat my final year exams in civil procedure and tax law while I was there, um, which was pretty bad because it also co coincided with the 1999 Cricket World Cup, um, which fortunately Australia won, but nevertheless it was very difficult to concentrate on my study. But it was such an incredible time. Um, it's a formal United Nations certificate in international human rights law. And so you're taught about all the substantive law in international human rights law. But we also had the opportunity to go to UNESCO in Paris and work there, work for the ILO, um, the International Labour Organization, uh, do some work for the World Health Organization and the Red Cross. And you know, got to meet Mary Robinson, which I just thought was the best thing since sliced bread. It was just fabulous meeting her. Um, and we organised the UN meetings and, and I was able to write the re report of the Secretariat for one of the declaration meetings. So it was really terrific um, 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 uh, experience. And I always say um, that it was really the pinnacle of my career at the beginning of my career. Um, um, but I won't say it's all been downhill from there because that's not true, Brennan. Um, but that first experience taught me something very valuable and that was my first dilemma between, between whether I wanted to cast myself as an activist um, you know, a grassroots activist, or whether I wanted to cast myself as a scholar in international law or, or, or an academic in human rights. Um, and I learned very on from that experience um, uh, in Geneva that in order to have credibility and have my voice heard, I would have to keep studying. Um, so I immediately enrolled in a Masters of International Law at the ANU and then, and then after that my PhD. And that was because that was what all my European peers had done. So every person that was my age at the UN were doing masters or PhDs. Um, they were all in the process of doing it while I was there and it was quite clear you can't work at that level if you don't continue your study. It's really important that you know and understand public international law and demonst demonstrate that by publishing scholarly articles, but importantly casting a critical eye to universal truths about human rights. So I enrolled in my LLM at, at the ANU and it was really the best move of my life. I think that LLMs are a really good bridge between the LLB and, and, and a PhD because the coursework is so varied and you learn a lot of the areas of law that you didn't get to learn in your LLB. And, in, and, and ANU in particular has an exceptional international, not as good as us, but an exceptional <laughs> international law course um, where I was taught how to think critically. And that's really important when you're a scholar. I mean, by that point, I was very indoctrinated by the UN system, having worked for them. And I was very evangelical about human rights. And then I met Hilary Charlesworth. Um, and I was very, I think, fortunate to be scholar, uh, schooled by um, Hilary Charlesworth, who always challenged us to think about whose experience the law is grounded in and to draw out the many tensions that exist in a consent-based system like international law and the treaty system. For example, the voluntary nature of international law presents huge problems if you're trying to be remedial. Another lesson I learned from her is, is the way that lawyers tend to measure, particularly in human rights, success in court victories. Um, she always said it's such a limited view of the law uh, because victories do not always lead to success or change. And I think that's certainly uh, a caution um, um, that um, has been expressed by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people during this process of constitutional um, uh, recognition around the country. 
people are very aware that, for example, Kawata, um, the case in Kawata didn't lead to anything. So I think that my decision to take my LLM was very much shaped by my experiences at the UN and I learnt, um, um, and, and I think the LLM has been probably one of the most significant things in helping me with my thinking about human rights. So I was working for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission as a, as a practising lawyer, having done the graduate diploma in legal practice at ANU also. And I really did not like being a lawyer. Um, I didn't like the process of law. Um, and I found myself on the internet a lot, um, uh, reading a lot of op-eds by George Williams in particular. Um, and I realised that I was more interested in the law reform and critique of law side of the law than the practice of the law. That could also be because I was a bad lawyer. But um, uh, what really kept me hanging around working for ATSIC as a young lawyer was the fact that I was able to attend some of these UN uh, uh, drafting sessions and, and they were very encouraging of, uh, and nurturing of young and emerging talent. Um, but having standard setting experience under your belt in your early 20s was a real bonus because you're able to witness multilateral diplomacy and the way wheeling and dealing occurs around emerging norms in the UN state system. And you lose very quickly romanticised notions of the UN, um, the human rights system and how the UN works. But I was fortunate at ATSIC that George Williams um, was recruiting uh, someone to work with him on the Bill of Rights project. Um, and I jumped at the chance when I saw the ad on the ATSIC intranet. Um, and I moved to Sydney to work with George as the director of the Bill of Rights project. Um, uh, and, and that was invaluable experience where George taught me how to write scholarly legal articles. But also it gave me the space to do serious thinking around international law. Um, and um, what was going on at the Indigenous uh, international rights level in terms of the drafting of the Declaration. Um, during all this period, the Declaration um, had um, pretty much ground to a halt in international law. Um, from the outset, the working group that uh, established the, uh, the, the, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, faced really serious challenges because you're coming up against states and the sovereignty of states and indigenous peoples who, who mounted um, continual challenges to the legitimacy of, of states and state sovereignty. So the, at the UN it was a constant struggle between in indigenous observers and, and states over content and process. And states were really effectively divided into two camps. Those were who were in favour of indigenous rights and self-determination and those who won't. But I don't want to give the impression that they were e even those, those camps because they weren't. In particular, the Kansas group, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the United States, were really the most obstructionist um, in their conduct and persistent objections to provisions relating to land rights and self-determination. So the draft declaration really um, for an international declaration uh, when it went to this working group was very over-elaborated in parts um, it, it contained some grammatical errors and it was inconsistent and had repetitive language. Um, so early on it was clear that the states wanted to amend the text, um, which is not unusual. I, I think it's unheard of for a text to just go all the way through the system unchanged. Um, but in contrast to that position, many Indigenous members of the Indigenous caucus wanted the immediate adoption of the declaration with no changes whatsoever um, and they wanted no debate. Um, so it led to this really um, um, complicated um, uh, situation uh, in, in at the United Nations where states wouldn't budge and Indigenous peoples wouldn't budge from the no change position. The no change position on the Indigenous peoples part is because of a really strong emotional attachment to the original text. They felt that if you amended the text you would corrupt um, the, the, the aspirations of, of those Indigenous drafters who had participated in its drafting but had since deceased. Um, so there was a really strong position that it should not be touched at all. So the no change position of the Indigenous caucus resulted um, in the rejection of any suggestions uh, for amendment to the original text. So these two positions really collided and there was no progress for, for years and years, eight to ten years. Um, so obviously before progress could be made on the text, flexibility would be needed on both sides. 
Um, so Indigenous observers would need to be much more flexible in their negotiating strategy. But states also would have to modify the really strict um, multilateral conference procedures that they were using um, 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 to prevent um, um, Indigenous access to some of the changes that were being made uh, to the text in secret. I mean, eventually um, the no change position was abandoned and there was a marked shift in the Indigenous position from 2004 onwards. But I think it was a really interesting, um, um, it was an interesting exercise to be a part of in terms of the strategy that you use in international law to engage with states. Um, there was an interesting moment actually in 2004 when they decided to abandon the no change position. And I think Ruth would remember, but there was an elder from New South Wales who had attended the declaration um, and he, he just got sick of the whole contest of, of, of the states versus Indigenous peoples. And he got up in the middle of the room and he, and he started, uh, well, we started talking or quite loudly in his um, traditional language. Um, and then he said, words, words, words. That's all you people ever talk about in this place is words. Um, what we need to do is do what we do at home and just sit down you know, around a campfire with some butcher's paper and work it out that way. So um, what was really interesting about that particular moment in the, in the conference room um, uh, uh, meeting is that the chairperson actually did call a break to the meeting. And what he did was he got an overhead projector and a pen and he adopted an alternate approach to, to, to drafting and that was he would go through article by article with the pen and try and work it out that way. Um, and everyone seemed to like that idea. And then he divided the room up into the worst, um, uh, you know, most intransigent Aboriginal groups with the state that they hated the most. So, for example, the Hawaiians were put with the United States and, and so, so it went and he sent them off into little drafting groups into different rooms to, to, um, to, to, to try and work out an alternative text. And what was interesting about that, when you read a lot of the literature on multilateral um, diplomacy and, and conference room procedures is that the, the, the chairperson was really effective and was able to negotiate a break um, um, in, in the tension by um, dis, um, disbanding the usual UN conference procedures and, and adopting a more casual and informal approach to drafting. Um, of course, Bill might say it was because of him. But um, what was uh, really striking to me and all of that was that once no change was abandoned, um, the Indigenous caucus began to argue that in fact they had stronger legal rights within their own states. Most of them have treaties, constitutional recognition, really strong statutory recognition and therefore they thought well maybe we won't support the redrafted text. Um, and I was a part of a very, this, the Indigenous Australian delegation was one of few Indigenous delegations along with some small Pacific Islanders who were, or islands that were isolated in this discussion because we all originated from states that have no treaties, no constitutional recognition um, and no bills or charter of rights that enshrine non-discrimination. So that had a really huge impact on my thinking was the fact that we were really isolated as um, Indigenous Australians with a very tiny, tiny group of other states in the UN um, where we had absolutely no um, recognition or, or strong entrenched protection at all compared to some of the bigger countries like Canada, the United States and most of the Latin American countries were, were happy to walk away. Um, so it's quite extraordinary and, and, and that, that even today travelling around the country with the constitutional recognition panel um, that there is still such resistance to, to recognising in any form at all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander presence um, within our public institutions. Um, so I think I'll just conclude um, by ref reflecting on what I, um, I, I've learned on this journey, but conclude with some thoughts about the UN and the international human rights uh, system and Indigenous rights. Um, sometimes I think it would be easier to have become an ac activist because I could in then um, enter into a really cliched adversarial relationship with the state. But I felt that I was always driven by the question, uh, well, how do you affect real change? And I think a lot of us um, do that in, in, in our uh, daily work. But there's a lot of criticism aimed at in international lawyers, especially Indigenous uh, lawyers, um, uh, 
and especially from the Aboriginal community for people like me who attend these UN meetings or sit on the permanent forum on Indigenous issues. Um, uh, you know, people think people still think it's a junket, and, and, and but, but it's it, but it's not an um, it's it's not an uncommon response of the community, and, and it's to be expected that response too, because people want a very clear um, uh, path from the work that you're doing in New York or Geneva, and some effective change on the ground. And if people can't see that, then then they feel like it is a waste of time. Um, but how do you reflect? Uh, how do you affect real change? In, in the time uh, that I've been doing uh, this work for about 10 years at, at the UN, I think um, I've come to think in, that change is also challenging um, the UN and its processes, its flaws, and challenging and questioning um, the human rights um, legal framework, and always casting a critical eye to um, the unquestioned truths of this uh, movement um, and I think that's how you can improve things and how you move forward. I cannot emphasise enough the importance of adopting a critical lens when it comes to human rights and the human rights system. There is great danger in adopting an uncritical and evangelical approach to human rights entrenchment. And last year I was uh, elected to the UN Permanent Forum um, by the UN Economic Social Council, yet I was and am a known critic of the Permanent Forum and I've been critical of its processes and its mandate and I continue to be critical of it. But this, this was well known to the states who were um, voting for me, but it didn't deter any states in their support from um, the position because, as, as many of them said, institutions are me meant to evolve and have a, having a critical eye is, is an important thing. I think looking back um, of all the Aboriginal people in this field that I've worked with, um, the only thing that set me aside from them is that I continued to study and I, um, and, and I think that that has in the end been re the real difference. Um, um, and I think that study has really um, um, helped me in my thinking because I was never really sold on a black and white right and wrong view of the world. So the Indigenous versus the non-Indigenous, um, the purity of Aboriginal culture versus um, the immoral culture of the Western world. Um, and there's a lot of those, that binary positions that go on um, at the UN level. I think further study gives you the opportunity to think really deeply um, 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 and, um, about these issues and to be intellectually challenged um, by your peers. For example, my PhD thesis, which will be soon published in a book from Brendan, <laughs> very squarely challenges the male-dominated paradigm of international law as well as domestic political domains where the right to self-determination is skewed in favour of a reductionist male notion of the Aboriginal person. And we know in Aboriginal affairs, self-determination is a sacred cow. And I've mapped the shifting form of the right to self-determination in international law, how the state promotes a restrained yet patriarchal concept of self-determination, and how the Aboriginal political domain itself has internalised and constructed this state-centric narrative that excludes uh, and marginalises Aboriginal women. Um, Self-determination is characterised um, by a lack of nuance and it necessitates that traditional rights language be translated into a language that all Aboriginal people can understand and use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and sometimes casting a critical eye over these things makes you extremely unpopular, um, um, especially um, when in Indigenous affairs uh, we are a group that is defined by collectivism, by a united voice, um, um, and that unified position is a really important tool in political advocacy. So when you step outside of that as an Aboriginal person and start to critique some of the things um, that we advocate for, um, it does make for some difficult, um, difficult conversations. But the one question that remains with me and I'll finish on is, is, and I'll finish with, is that with the multitudes of international norms and the system of treaties that are devoted to human rights, including the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and this elaborate system of, of scrutiny, um, why are, are these international human rights standards still ignored by states like Australia? Um, why accept these rights um, and not implement them?
um, why accept them and fight any scrutiny of the implementation of those rights? Um, and how do we change the way we approach rights uh, in this country? I mean, I found it striking during the Charter of Rights campaign, the inability of our sector to explain to ordinary people why rights are important. Our language is cliched, our appeals evangelical and incapable of giving texture and nuanced, nuance to the universe of human rights. And indeed, I wish when Martha Nussbaum came to speak that she had spoken about her capabilities theory instead because I think her work and the work of Amartya Sen go some way to doing that. But I'm not the only international human rights lawyer thinking about these questions um, and I'm no closer to any of the answers than any other human rights lawyer. Um, but that is the great challenge of the international human rights law system. Um, but when I think about my journey, I know that when I started studying human rights, I wasn't even asking those questions, so there's some progress. Um, but I think there's something important still about going through that evangelical stage where you are completely indoctrinated by the UN human rights system and the promise it brings. It's important to go through that phase because the critical eye you develop is something that's not forced or mimicked, but it's something that you have experienced. Um, and a journey is, is as much about the disappointments and the letdowns and the cynicism that you develop along the way as it is about the triumphs. Um, um, and you go through that journey to come to the reali realisation that, well, change actually does not come very quickly. And that's a very hard thing to learn. Um, but one thing I can say from going from Queensland and now working with the UN on the permanent forum is that I've never lost and never will lose faith that that change will come um, and um, um, through the UN human rights system. And, and I hope I never do lose that faith. Uh, thank you very much for listening.